another beautiful, wonderful Sunday morning, Lord's Day morning to all of you this morning. This is a special day in worship. It is also a very special day for Gina today. It's the day of her baptism in the in-house service. And I'm sure we all join together to wish her the very best in her life that is to come. So very blessed to you, Jean. Gina, as you live your life and as it unfolds for you. This is Pastor Jim this morning. As we come to our devotional time this morning, we would like to take an extended thought about what we introduced last week. We had shared thoughts for a while upon the great blessings that God has showered upon we humans. And then last week, we introduced a new theme, which has to do with what the real nature and being of God is really like. The world has many views of this, all the way from him being an old grandfather-like being sitting in heaven as an aged one, just looking down, observing what is happening, but not paying much attention to it, to one who is a firebrand sitting, as it were, up there, angry and trying to force his subjects to conform to his will. Last week, we shared two basic scriptures which characterizes the Judeo-Christian understanding of the nature of God as it relates to us, his creation. The one overriding one was that God is love and all that that means. And we have seen and experienced that throughout the ages in his creation, his relationship and treatment of mankind throughout history. The other side of that is that with the bad behavior of we humans to destroy each other and ignore God, he is also a flaming fire against evil which harms people. And so he has that tough side to his being as well. In our thoughts today, we would like to share some thoughts about the balance between those two aspects of his nature. And in doing so, we can also find a balance in our own lives as to how to balance them in our own relationships with other fellow human beings. We too can be very loving and caring in life with our children, our friends and fellow workers and the like. But how do we handle things when they get off calder with others around us? That poses some problems, oftentimes some very serious problems. What do we do about them? We want to refer to the same two scriptures we did last week. The last verses of Hebrews chapter 12 and the first half of Second Peter chapter 3 which gives us some real insights in both aspects of our relationship with God and with each other. Let us begin by observing what Hebrews 12:25 records. It is just an overall statement from verse 24 where it talks of God speaking better things, that is communicating his covenant with us, that we should live by that which makes for good relationships and good lives. Then it says in verse 25 to 28 the following things. See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things which are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved, let us have grace 
whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and with godly fear. This is an overall statement that encompasses those who absolutely refuse to pay any attention to what he has taught us. The world is filled with such people. God is not a part of their lives. They have no time nor use for him. This condition is further defined and emphasized in Romans chapter 1, verses 17 to 25. It is a bit extensive, but it really does characterize a lot of the world and the attitudes that there are towards God. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of God from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they may be without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into the image of a corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. That is quite a passage, isn't it? quite an indictment upon the, that section of the world. Right now we see it going on all around our world. The bottom of the barrel, at least for me, is considering the current spreading of the poison of drugs in candy-like bits to affect the young, killing thousands and more in North America every month and every year. And then add to that everything else that they're doing to abuse people, left and right. It gives such a clear example of what this nature of God towards that kind of thing. How can we love his ingenious and wonderful creation, which he created for good, and not be incensed with wrath and anger and punishment? It is a place where both the, his nature of love and of a flaming fire meet. And is it not a place where we can sense how we should meet such conditions ourselves? At one time it took the flood of Noah to meet it on a world scale. Things were so bad. That is something for us to really think about. <laughs>
What a challenging song. It's just over 300 years old, and it is still popular today. Written in England in a time of unrest and insecurity and degradation by Sir Ivic Watts. It is still sometimes used, actually, at memorial services in Memorial's Day, Remembrance Day, right here in Canada. A significant song of history that still has meaning to it. Last week we had encouraged everyone to read Second Peter, chapter 3, as background for some of our thoughts during this period of time. We really hope that you have. If not, we would encourage you to read it sometime this week. And if you have, it might be a good thing to read it once more. It is filled with some serious thoughts about our attitudes toward God and how that will ultimately play out into eternity itself. The point of the passage relative to this are the first ten verses of that chapter, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir you up in pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers working, walking after their own lusts, and they were saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that the word of God in the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water, and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved under the fire against the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Summed up, these people in this passage that it talks about make fun of God. The word here is that they scoff at him. We would say in our culture that they make light of him. They just don't pay any attention to him. They go their own way ignoring him. They act as though he doesn't exist, or that his existence doesn't matter. How much of that is in our world right now? How much of it is around us right now? And if we're honest, don't we all struggle with it at least a little bit ourselves sometimes? The dividing line between the two attitudes towards it is simply that one doesn't care and the other does care and tries to do something better about it. Let me say that that distinction is vital to both understanding the nature of God in this matter and our own personal well-being in dealing with it. This attitude matter does not have to do with people who have never known anything about God in their culture and in their knowledge. It is obvious from the passage that they knew 
that these people knew about God and about the things of God because they gave their reason for not paying attention to him. It is their view that God hasn't lived up to their expectations of what he should have done. And there is much of this notion in the world right now. It is the notion that God wasn't there, he didn't come, or he didn't take a hand. And for me, we really need to realize that there is real serious things in that kind of thinking. Some have known that there is disappointment that Christ hasn't actually returned yet the second time, and they express that. For me, I've actually known the unfolding of this notion for some 90 years of my own actual memory. We had neighbors when I was about 10 years old who quit jobs and waited for the Lord to return at a time they understood he was coming. And I have experienced that notion now for 90 years of people getting tired of waiting and thinking that he was going to come along the way and hadn't as yet. The book of Second Thessalonians was written by Paul to the church of Thessalonica in Greece in his time because they too were thinking exactly the same thing and some of them had quit working for that reason and were just sitting waiting for that return. It is in that context that he has ways to uh, frame the quote, if a man will not work, neither let him eat. We shouldn't get sidetracked here so much, though it deals with the reality of the passage, because people have all kinds of excuses for ignoring God beyond this. The passage deals with those who have enough knowledge of him to elaborate or to explain why they are ignoring him. Whether or not they actually express it is beside the point. It is the basis for their failed behavior and their relationship with him. Then the passage goes on a little further, and it says they are willingly ignorant of some of the basic truths which dispute their notion. In other words, they had the ability to find out the truth of their unrest, but they did nothing to find out that truth on their own. To boil it down, they were not serious people about relationships with God. It didn't matter to them. They were out for themselves. There was no appreciation for all of the goodness and the blessings of God that we have talked about this last while. This is really quite a point to talk about in this Thanksgiving season that we will talk about now in the following uh, term after our next hymn. <laughs>
Florida has just now been through its fifth worst hurricane in history, in 500 years at least of history, and the worst in the last hundred years. That is something to think about in this age in which we live. As humans, we think we are so smart, just so smart, that we can do anything. There is no doubt that we have come a long ways to the place where we can do a lot of things, at least a lot of things that in our culture and understanding of that culture is phenomenal. But really, just how phenomenal is it? How can we possibly compare what the articles, the devices, the technology of today with that which is even ancient, even the universe itself, about the magnitude, the complexity, and the preciseness of that universe. That is absolutely phenomenal. As smart as we think we are, we still know so little about the total nature of it. We don't even know its real size, for that matter. Every new telescope is bigger and better than the one before it, and it reaches out even further than the one before it. And it finds only what? More universe. Up until now, it just continues to extend that, and we know not where the end of it is. There are about two billion galaxies of it known now, and about two billion star worlds in each of those galaxies, all functioning precisely as a harmonious unit. How do we compare with that? Or how do we look at the other end of the smallest microbe that is oper has an operating system of life that is so small that it takes a major microscope or another instrument of some kind to detect it? It's something to think about that. And when we relate it to our human anatomy, the functions of each organ in themselves absolutely are phenomenal. And beyond that, to have a body of flesh and bones that can function as we do with the ability of our minds to think and to plan what we can and then the sense and emotions that are in that body that can engulf that whole body, that body of clay. It's both phenomenal and ingenious or for it to last for some hundred years or more. That too is phenomenal. It is beyond phenomenal. Then to live in a world with a precise air level to support it, and edible food to power it, what can we say? Our minds cannot even begin to fathom the blessings that we have and we are, and of the existence of life, and the support of life, and all that goes with that. That is completely beyond our ability to do much about, but to tinker with it, though that is not to be underestimated because we were made and taught by our Creator to do just that. We didn't even give ourselves that ability. It was given to us by the Divine at the beginning when he said in Genesis 1-3, to in our language, the first commandment given to mankind was to manage the world. That in itself was a mighty gift to us. May we be encouraged, all of us, to let our minds wander and cogitate and wonder at the mammoth blessings that we are a part of in our world of today. Let us not be asking the question, what have we to be thankful for? This was the problem of those who and that were actually referred to in our devotional passages today. Simply no thoughts about these were very basic matters for them, 
and yet they're very, very crucial to all of us. If we really stop and think about the matters and blessings that we have from God, if we really stop and think about them as they recorded in our lives, it makes us stop and understand and be very grateful for him. In the passage of 2 Peter in verse 9, we read to, that we read today, another of the great qualities of the nature of God is disclosed. It says that he is long-suffering towards us. That quality is indeed significant. That is, he is patient with us. Patience is a part of his nature. He has worked with us, endured with us throughout the centuries to bring us to where we are today in a world much less volatile and violent than it once was, much less fractured than it also was historically. Even with some of that yet to be overcome, it is the great time in which we have lived. Let us today be grateful and thankful to him for so much. It is an awesome matter. God of the universe, how great he is. The heavens declare
as we come to our devotional time this morning. It is truly the God of the universe that has been in our minds throughout the ages as he has spoken to us from time to time. And then when you add up all of that life that we have experienced as human beings, we cannot help but appreciate and be thankful to him for all that he has been and all that he is and all that he has done and the blessings that we have had. And when we think of how much we have fallen short as a human race to respond to him in like manner, to be serious, to be loving and caring for him in return. And yet he has had patience. He's been long suffering with us and for us. And then the coming of Christ and all that that meant in his time. And then his death, not only for the people of his time, but the people before him whose sins have been rolled forward year by year for thousands of years. And then looking back from our time for we that he looked forward to in his death for those who would come after him, as it says in the book of Acts, the people of every nation. We cannot help today to be very deeply thankful in this Thanksgiving season for him, for what he has done, for Christ, his son, and what that means to us in our lives. And in this time of communion this morning, may we be very grateful and thank him and our Lord for all of those things and the memories that we have in this service this morning of the broken body and of the shed blood through the emblems that we share. Our Father in heaven, as we come around the table this morning, we're very mindful, Lord, of your patience, your long suffering, all that you have endured with us, and all that you have done to make life better for us, and to redeem us and bring us back to yourself, and to a spiritual foundation for life, and a hope for eternal life. Bless us around the table this morning. May it be a time of real memory and a time of meaning for us 
that we might walk more closely with Thee in the week and the days that lie ahead. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, one and all, for joining together and sharing today in this time of devotion and worship and the memory and celebration of our Lord's life and death and resurrection. May God be with you in the week ahead. God bless. Bye-bye for now.